Good morning, celebrate. I'm going to say God is good. You say all the time. God is good and all the time. Well, if you're a guest, we just want to thank you for allowing us to come into your home and join with you together today as we worship our God. If you take a moment to click on the connection card that's right above you there, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to connect with you as well. And also, if you're watching live in the bottom, there's a little chat box. Just take a moment to say hi. Let us know who many people are watching with you as well. Um, there's also a blue button that says live prayer. If you click on that, you can actually pray live with a pastor who's there to pray with you. Um, and throughout the week, if there's things that we can pray for you and, and lift up requests, you can go to our website, click on prayer requests, or you can also call, email, or text the church as well. The last thing you'll see above you there is the give button. And that's the way that we return to God with our tithes and offerings um, during this time and, and really through any time as well. Well, today I am so excited. We got a lot of great things planned for today. The first thing is we're starting a brand new series called Living God's Way. And this is kind of our summer kickoff. Congratulations, Celebrate. You made it to summer. It's no, it's been a long spring, but uh, we're excited to do this together. The next few months, we're going to be walking through what this series means. And to kind of kick it off, we've got a couple special things planned for today. Um, tonight at 6 p.m., we're going to have a special online gathering. We've been talking about this for the past couple weeks. It's called Together. It's going to be hosted by Dr. Wayne Schmidt, who's the general superintendent of our denomination. And we're going to be joining together in prayer and worship of God with brothers and sisters from all around the world. And we're going to ask that God's Spirit do a work in us. Because see, today is actually the birthday of God's church. It's the moment when the disciples were filled with the Spirit and went out and started sharing God's love with everyone. And that's what we're celebrating here today. And in preparation for that, um, we are going to take communion together. Now, I know that we're not physically together, but we're going to do it digitally. And we've done this before. And so what I'd like you to do is after our message, we're going to partake in that together. So if you want to go right now and you can get some crackers, you can get chips, you can get bread, you can get juice, you can get milk, whatever. Um, as you remember, in my house, we have the chicken and the biscuit. These are the very holy crackers. I believe these are God's crackers, kind of like Chick-fil-A is God's restaurant, chicken and biscuit. Okay, we're going to use those in our house. Um, and then we've got this Simply Lemonade that we're going to use, and that's going to be our communion together. So you want to go ahead and get that, and then after the message, We'll walk through that together as well, because the point of communion is we're going to remember. We want to remember what the Lord Jesus did for us, and we want to celebrate that together as well. Well, last week when we met together, we asked a question, and it's a question that's on the hearts and minds of so many people right now. And that question is when, right? When will we get back together again? When will we get back together again? And my response last week, if you remember, if you were here, is I said, we've never stopped getting back together again. We've been here every week together online. We've also, all of our life groups have been on Zoom. We've continued to do that as well. But again, I said, I understand the question. When are the face-to-face -face gatherings going to be coming together? And this is not a question our church is asking. Literally, restaurants, school districts, governments, businesses are all walking through the exact same thing right now. So what does that look like for our church? Well, this week, we did an online survey of just asking that question just to see. We wanted to hear from you. Our first question was, which best describes your attitude towards an in-person Sunday gathering? 46% of the people said, I will attend an in-person gathering the first opportunity I get. 40% said, I feel cautious but open to the idea. And 13% of the people said, I will only attend online. The next question was in regards to our kids' ministry, and that's a very important part of our church. Just looking at the people who responded who did have kids, um, half of them said they would bring their kids but keep them with during the adult gathering. One-fourth said... I would take the kids to a kid's environment, and one-fourth of people said, I would not bring my kids at all. Our next question talked about precautions. What do you expect Celebrate Church to do to make the environment safe? The top three answers were provide hand sanitizer, encourage social distancing, and sanitize the entire environment before and after our service. Our fourth question was about, would you feel comfortable attending small home worship gatherings with select friends and family? 46% said they weren't currently to that. 26.7% said I'd consider that. And interestingly enough, the same percentage said, yes, I would absolutely consider that as well. As you can see, there are three different 
ideas really of how it should look. The how, not the when, but the how. And we've kind of developed kind of three different, we're calling them positions. Now these aren't people, and we'll talk about that more later. These are positions that people have. And the first position is, I'm really not comfortable meeting a person. I'm gonna continue to meet online. I, I'm not comfortable going out yet. If that's you right now, I want you to hear something. That's okay. We're fine with that. And you're just okay to do that as well. There's a second group that we talked about that are more cautious. They say, I'm cautious, but I'm open to the idea. I'm open to the conversation. We want you to know that's okay. We're glad that you're with us and part of it. And then the third position is what we're calling it, is really people that are ready to meet in person and to do that. Romans 12.10 says, we need to honor one another above ourselves. We talked about this in the video, but I want to just mention it again here, church. To honor one another above ourselves means I need to understand my neighbor's position before sharing mine. Because as I said, wherever you're at in any of those three positions, that's okay. And if we're more concerned about sharing my opinion without honoring the other person, we're not doing what God's asked us to do. We need to stop, as a church, we need to stop the shaming. We need to stop telling people that somehow they are less spiritual because they either want to meet together or they're not ready to meet together. Church, that is only the work of the enemy. The enemy is about division and dissension. You know what my God is about? My God is about unity. He is about coming together. And as a church, we need to come together and be unified not divided. And so what we're going to do is starting next Sunday and continuing through the month of the June, we are going to start in-person gatherings. Now you might be, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now I want to clarify that. It, it's going to look a little different. And here's why it's going to look a different. We're not going to go to Minerva's to meet in person. See, we're going to meet in our homes. So if you are of the third position where you're like, I'm ready, pastor, I want to go. This is my challenge to you. What we're gonna ask for you to do is we're gonna ask you to host an online gathering in your home. Opening your home and saying, hey, I'm open to that. I want, to, I want people to come, I want them to join me, because that's the heart of that, is the fellowship. We wanna have that fellowship together. We're asking that you would do that in your home. Now, I as the pastor, I'm not physically able to be in everyone's home, all right? So we're gonna actually do it online. So we'll give you the tools and resources to be able to do that. And if you have questions and you're like, okay, I don't know what, how big, how many people should I have? Well, that's going to depend on the size of your house. If you have a large house and can accommodate lots of people, you might want to think of a higher number. If you have a smaller house, maybe think of a smaller number as well. Maybe you might be thinking, well, I don't know if I have the technology or the TV. We want to talk to you about that. We want to help you, equip you so you're able to host that in your home if you are comfortable with doing that. So if that's you, if you're in the third kind of position, you're saying, I want to do that. We need you this week to either email or text. I want to be a host. I want to be a host. Email or text that to us and we will connect with you and give you the resources. Now you might say, well, I don't know what I'm doing. Can I help you something? We've never done it that way before either. Okay. I, I never planted a church before, but it didn't stop me from doing it. So that's one way that we're gonna do that. Now, for the people in the second position that said, I, I'm open to the idea, but I'm a little cautious. We wanna tell you, you can do either one. You can stay at home like you've been doing and continue to watch online, or if you feel comfortable, you can come and join one of these in-home gatherings. And if that's the position that you're at, you, same thing, you just text or email, I'd like to join a gathering. That will let us know, hey, I'd like to get connected with somebody so I can watch together. And I want to be in a home watching with somebody together as well. Now, if you're in the first position, this is a great thing. Just keep doing what you're doing. We're going to continue to do this. We'd encourage you to engage in the live chat and the prayer that all of the groups, no matter where you're meeting at, can keep connected and stay together. And then all three groups throughout the week, I would highly encourage you to be part of a life group and continue to do that as well. You know, we've talked about the question of when, when. We've talked about the question of how, how. Next week, what we're gonna do as part of this series is we really want to unpack this idea of why. Because 
we need to understand why we're doing something because the why is more important than the when or the how. And that's what we're going to do. So next week, we want you to join us as we unpack that as well. Let's go ahead and pray. God, this pandemic did not take you by surprise. Lord, you knew from the beginning of time that we would be where we're at today. And God, on this Pentecost Sunday, as we gather together to celebrate the birth of your church, and we, we do it by remembering it with communion, and, and later on tonight, joining with our brothers and sisters online to celebrate this, this moment, God. And as we have the conversation about starting these gatherings where people can, can come together and worship together, God, and if they're not ready for that, that's okay, that they can continue to do what we've been doing here, God that we would be one, God, as a church family, and we would continue to be unified. We would stop shaming other people for where they're feeling at, where their position is, God, because you didn't call us to do that, God. You called us to love our neighbor. God, you called us to honor one another above ourselves, and Jesus, you modeled that for us while you were here on earth. So God, I just pray that as we do this, we would be unified. We would be together, and we would be one. We thank you and we praise you. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together as a family. If you don't know the words, they'll be on the screen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's put our hearts in praises that sing to the only holy.
sing aloud, hallelujah, to the God Almighty, hallelujah, 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 Jesus reigns.
James Stockdale was the highest ranking U.S. military official who was captured in the Vietnam War by the North Vietnamese and held captive in the infamous POW camp dubbed the Hanoi Hilton. Stockdale was held there for eight years, tortured over 20 times, and had no certainty of ever being released or seeing his family again. In his book, Good to Great, author Jim Collins interviewed Admiral Stockdale about his time as a POW. Collins asked Stockdale how he dealt with his situation without knowing the certainty of the outcome. Here is Stockdale's response. I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining moment of my life which in retrospect, I would not trade for anything. So Collins followed up with the question of, so who didn't make it out of the camp? Who wasn't so lucky? And Stockdale's response was fascinating, Collins. This is what Stockdale said. Oh, that's easy. It was the optimists. You see, the optimists were the ones who would say things like, oh, we'll be home by Christmas. Christmas would come, Christmas would go. Then they would say, oh, we'll be home by Easter. Easter would come, Easter would go, and the cycle would go on and on until eventually, in Stockdale's words, the optimist would die of a broken heart. Then Stockdale would make a powerful statement, and this statement was so powerful, in fact, that because of this quote in this book, to this day, this principle is what's known as the Stockdale Paradox. So church, I don't want you to miss this. Listen to what Stockdale says. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality. Today, we're starting a brand new series called Living God's Way. We are going to be on a journey through the next two months of the summer and the life of a church. And in order to introduce that to you today, I want to set this up by, by talking with you about this idea that in life, we are all going to face disappointments. Some of us, it might be the doctor might come and might say that it's cancer. Some of us might not get the job that we thought that we wanted. Some of us might not have the marriage we thought and maybe the marriage has ended. Or maybe the friendship that we thought would never end has come to an end. Or maybe there's a move that you weren't expecting. Every single one of us has just lived through a global pandemic where we've been faced with certain situations we don't know how to deal with. And in these moments, I want us to remember the words of Admiral Stockdale where he says, Never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end with the discipline to confront the facts of your current reality. So today, church, again, by way of introduction in our series, Living God's Way, I want to unpack this question for you. And this is our question today. How do you keep the faith while confronting the facts of your current reality? How do you keep the faith while confronting the facts of your current reality? We are in a new era of our world, and we need to recognize our world has completely changed. We've been asking the question as a church, when are we going to get back together again and meet in person? But it's so much bigger than that. There's so many unanswered questions right now. When will there be concerts again? When will there be ball games again? When will there be packed restaurants again? This past week, my son and my family, it was my son's birthday, and we went out for supper together. And we went in a restaurant that we've been to dozens of times before. And it looked completely different. There was tables that were empty. There was people wearing masks. It's just, it looked different. Our economy is, is we've had record unemployment. There's a lot of unknown things. When will we be able to go to a grocery store again and buy food again and not have to wait to get it? And when will we have to plan out toilet paper a month in advance? Church, we need to confront the facts of our current reality while not losing faith in the outcome. And you guys have heard me say this over and over again throughout this whole time that we've been going through this together. God is still on the throne. We may think that our world might look differently, but I want to help you with something. God has the outcome, and we need to have faith in that. So how do we keep the faith while confronting the facts 
of our current reality. One of the things I love is that when culture says something like the Stockdale Paradox, and we find out that this has existed in God's word for thousands of years. I just love that when we find out stuff and we affirm it, we look at God's word and we're like, hey, it turns out God's word is true. So today, by way of introduction, I want to show you an example of where this happened in Scripture. I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter 32. If you don't have a Bible, I'd highly encourage you version. If you're watching us live right now, there's a little button that says Bible. It's actually a link directly to version, And you can go to Jeremiah 32 and just point and click and read along with us while you're doing that as well. It's also available on any smartphone, tablet, or computer device. We'd love to have you do that. And just to set it up for you, if you're not familiar with Jeremiah and specifically chapter 32, God's people, the nation of Israel, were in their darkest moment in history. Jeremiah had been sent to the people when things were literally at their worst. For generations, God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, had turned their backs on God. And like a loving parent, over and over again, God would try to come to them and try to help them understand you're, you're not doing it the way that I told you to. And if you choose to try to do it your own way, it's not going to go well for you. I love you. I want you to come back. And eventually, just like a loving parent sometimes finds, their children, the nation of Israel, had reached a point where they had gotten themselves in a tough spot. And the king of Babylon had come. Nebuchadnezzar had come. And he was going to conquer the nation of Israel. And that's right where we pick it up in Jeremiah 32, verse 1. The army of the king of Babylon was then besieging Jerusalem. Now I want to pause right there for a minute because I don't think we understand this. I want to make sure we paint the picture of what's happening here. When we say siege today, that doesn't mean a lot to us because we don't experience this. Back in this day, sieges were a very common thing. What would do an invading army would come in and the, the biggest, greatest defense that countries or cities would have, in particularly Jerusalem, is a wall that went around the city and they would close the gates and they would literally barricade themselves in their home and they would stay there in the city. And then the, the army, the invading army would surround the city and they would sit there and they would wait. They wouldn't let anyone go in or out because if they did, they would be dead. And they would just wait and wait and wait, sometimes for years. So the people on the inside would start to obviously be terrified. Eventually, they'd start starving. Eventually, they'd run out of water. And then when they were at their weakest, the army would come in and completely destroy the city. That's where Jeremiah and the nation of Israel are sitting with the king of Nebuchadnezzar surrounding the city and besieging it. Go back to chapter 32, Jeremiah, the prophet, was confined in the courtyard of the guard of the royal palace of Judah. Now Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned Jeremiah there, saying, why do you prophesy as you do? You say, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to give this city into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. Jer Zedekiah is saying to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, why can't you be more of an optimist? You see Nebuchadnezzar surrounding our city here, and, and you keep saying he's going to come in and he's going to capture it. Now, this isn't a bad question. I think Zedekiah really has wants what's right for the people, right? He doesn't want his people to be wiped out. He wants to try to save his people. If I can use this term, he wants life to go back to normal again. But the problem was Zedekiah wasn't willing to face the facts of his current reality. You see, and you've heard me preach this before, God had already spoken in this situation. All you have to do is go back to chapter 29. God had very clearly told Jeremiah and shared with the nation of Israel, this is going to happen. For 70 years, God had said, you are going to go into captivity. The king Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and he's going to take us into captivity. This is going to happen. This is the facts of our current reality. So I go back to our question for today. How do you keep the faith while confronting the facts of this current reality? And in order to do this, Jeremiah tells Zedekiah about something that happened in his life. Now, maybe it had just happened that day before. It might have happened a couple weeks before. We're not sure. But Jeremiah tells Zedekiah an experience that he had to answer this question for Zedekiah. And I believe the principle that Jeremiah is trying to teach his king Jeremiah wants us to learn today 
about this principle. And we want to walk through this together. So Jeremiah 32, verse 6. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hamel, son of Shalu, your uncle, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field at Anoth, because as a nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. Now I want to stop right there. A couple things. Number one, whenever you've heard me say this before. Whenever you're reading the Bible and you come across the name or a word and you're not sure how to pronounce it, just say it with confidence. Nobody else knows how to say it either. Okay, all right, that's the first thing. But the second thing you might be thinking is, what? <laughs> what does this have to do? You're telling me a story about your cousin comes to you and says, buy a field? Jeremiah, I don't understand. What are you talking about? And I think Zedekiah might have thought the same thing. So we'll go on. <laughs> then... Just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hamel came to me in the courtyard of the guard and said, Buy my field at Anoth, in the territory of Benjamin. Since it is your right to redeem it and to possess it, buy it yourself. I knew this was the word of the Lord. Have you ever had something happen to you and, and you kind of had like a premonition of something? And then all of a sudden that exact thing happened to you and you're like, whoa, that's weird. Anybody ever had that happen to them before? Okay, this is what just happened to Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a thought, which he thought was pretty random. My cousin Hamel is going to come to me and say, hey, buy this field. And then literally right after he thinks it, there shows up his cousin Hamel. And he says, buy this field. Now, here's what I want you to understand. A lot of times we want God to do the extraordinary. We want to see the mountain with the smoke on it. We want to see the flash of lightning in the sky. We want to see the hand writing on the wall. That's how God has spoke in the past before. And that's sometimes what we look for. But more often than not, and Jeremiah just showed us here, and I would affirm that as well, God is working in the ordinary. And it's when we have those daily intentional times with God where we become more in tune with God's voice we will see God work through the ordinary more than we will the extraordinary. And if we're not paying attention, sometimes we will miss that. And I found that true in my own life. Now, there's something else happening here that we need to just really kind of take some time to pull, pull apart more. And Zedekiah and Jeremiah would have easily understood this. But since we're 21st century Americans, when you read this passage, there's something that's very obvious that we might actually miss. And, and we want to talk about that for a second. And this is why I always say you should read the Bible in relationships with other people. People will say, I read the Bible and I don't get anything out of it. And my question is, do you read it alone or do you read it in community with other people? Because you can learn more about God's word when you read it with other people. So here's what I want you to understand about this passage that we just looked at. Hamel, Jeremiah's cousin, comes to Jeremiah and says, buy this field. It is your duty to buy it. Now, when he makes this statement, there's two things that I want you to understand about what Hamel's saying. Here's the first one, and this might be obvious. This is not a good deal for Jeremiah, all right? Th think about what I said before. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, is attacking the city. It's under siege, all right? He's sitting there waiting for everybody to, to fall down and, and to be hungry and all that stuff so he can come in and literally destroy the city. So land purchases at this time are not a wise investment. You're following that, okay? This is like being on the Titanic as it's sinking and going up to the counter and booking tickets on the next voyage. Not a smart thing to do, okay? So this is not a good deal for Jeremiah. But there's a second thing that I don't want you to miss. When Hamel says... It is your duty to buy it. Now, to understand Jewish law at that point is to say Jeremiah was the closest living relative to Hamel for this land. And so what Hamel is actually doing here, and I don't want you to miss this, Hamel is setting Jeremiah up. So this is what Hamel is saying. Jeremiah, you have to buy this field from me. See, and, and maybe he's thinking in his head, this is my crazy cousin Jeremiah, because what's going to happen here is if Jeremiah doesn't buy this land, he's actually in violation of the law. And Hamel can go to the king, who, by the way, Jeremiah is already in trouble with, miss that part, and say, listen, Jeremiah is not doing what he's supposed to do. He's in more trouble. Jeremiah gets in trouble if he doesn't buy the land. Jeremiah gets in more trouble. Hamel's off the hook, and Hamel can just take off and go, right? 
But let's say Jeremiah is crazy and actually does buy the land for whatever reason. Well, then Hamel can take the money, he can get out of town, and he's still off the hook. See how Hamel is setting up Jeremiah here? Don't you just love family, right? With, with relatives like that, who really needs enemies? How many of you know? Don't answer that question. Don't answer that question, all right? So this is not a good deal for Jeremiah. He And Hamel is setting Jeremiah up. Whether he buys it or doesn't buy it, Hamel's going to come out good, not good for Jeremiah. So here's what I want to go back to again. Look at what verse 8 says one more time. I knew this was the word of the Lord. Church, Jeremiah wasn't crazy. Jeremiah knew this was not a good deal. And Jeremiah knew his cousin was taking advantage of him. And Although, we'll find out here in a minute, Jeremiah didn't even understand why God had done that. Remember, God gave him the thought, all of a sudden it happened. I knew this must be the Lord. He didn't even understand why he was doing it. But his faith wasn't in why. His faith was in who. And he knew God's word. He knew the voice. And so look at what Jeremiah does in the very next verse. So I bought the field at Anoth for my cousin Hamel. I weighed out for him 17 shekels of silver. I signed and sealed the deed. I had it witnessed and weighed out the silver on the scales. I took the deed of the purchase, the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed copy, and I gave this deed to Barak, son of Nir, son of Mashi, in the presence of my cousin Hamel, and of the witnesses who had signed the deed of all the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the palace guard. You might be saying, what? What does that even mean? I don't understand. All right, I want to paint for you a picture of what's going on here so you can understand what Jeremiah is doing. Think about this again. There's a courtyard full of people. They are scared. They've been surrounded by a king. And Jeremiah goes to buy this field, right? And Jeremiah doesn't need to go through the entire formal process. Remember, the ship is sinking, okay? But yet Jeremiah not only says, yes, Hamel, I'll buy this field from you. He goes through every step and procedure of the formal process to purchase this deal. Now, if this wasn't so sad because of the situation, this would actually probably be hilarious. Okay, think about this. There's a group of soldiers over here, and they're probably throwing dice to see which one of them they're going to you know, use for food so they can continue to survive, right? Think about this. And Jeremiah comes along and says, excuse me, guys, I, can you just hold off on that for a second? I, I need four for a quorum. I'm going to witness this transaction here that me and my cousin are going to do about buying this land. Look at how ridiculous this must sound for Jeremiah to be saying this right now. And, and I'm wondering, because remember, Jeremiah is sharing this with Zedekiah the king. This has already happened. I'm wondering if when Jeremiah is sharing this with Zedekiah, if Zedekiah is saying, oh no, Jeremiah, you didn't do that. Jeremiah, no, 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 you didn't do that, did you? And Jeremiah's like, yeah, I did. And, and I'm wondering what Hamel's thinking right now, right? Hamel thinking he had his cousin and, and he was going to take advantage of him. I'm wondering if Hamel was sitting there going, Okay, Jeremiah, knock it off. No, no, seriously, Jeremiah, you don't need to do this. This is crazy. Why are you making a big deal about this? Jeremiah, stop. Quit, quit, quit doing this. Now, and maybe Jeremiah got a little pleasure out of that. I'm not sure. <laughs> but here's what I don't want you to miss. Jeremiah wasn't doing it to put on a show. And Jeremiah wasn't doing it again because he was crazy or because he didn't get what was going on. Jeremiah never confused faith that you will prevail in the end with the discipline to confront the facts of your current reality. Look at what Jeremiah says in verse 13. In their presence, after going through all this formal procedure, I gave these instructions. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Take these documents, both the sealed and unsealed copies of the deed of purchase, and put them in a clay jar so they will last for a long time. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. Jeremiah goes on to pray one of the most beautiful prayers in all the Bible. And church, he prayed it in the presence of all of those people who were witnessing that crazy transaction. He prayed it for Hamel, he prayed it not only for Zedekiah, who he's sharing this with, who he's answering the question, 
But I believe by the Spirit of God that Jeremiah prayed that prayer for you and I today in this community at this time. And I want to read you what it says in verse 16. I prayed to the Lord, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard for you. And I would encourage you to go back and I want you to read the rest of this prayer. I'm not going to read it for you now because I want you to read it because I want you to understand that this is personal. What Jeremiah is saying to you applies not only to the people in that courtyard, not only applies to Zedekiah that he's telling it to, it applies to you and I today. Jeremiah remembers who God is. Jeremiah remembers what God has done for them in the past. And Jeremiah does something that the Stockdale Principle shows later on is that he stakes the facts, the brutal facts, of the current reality that they're facing. And he closes in verse 25. And he says, And although the city will be given into the hands of the Babylonians, you, sovereign Lord, say to me, Buy the field with the silver and have the transaction witness. Jeremiah is asking God the question, God, I don't get it. God, I don't understand. God, help me with my current situation. I have the faith in the outcome, but right now it really stinks. I don't get it. And whatever situation you're facing right now, whether you're struggling in your business, whether you've lost your job, whether your marriage is on the rocks, whether the doctor says you might not recover, whatever your situation is right now, church, this is the prayer that I want you to pray. And, and I want you to understand that when you pray this prayer to God and when you put your heart and trust in the Lord God Almighty, that nothing is too hard for him. This is the response that the Lord gave Jeremiah. And I believe this is the response that God is giving us here today. Look at what God says to Jeremiah in verse 26. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? God reaffirms Jeremiah's statement of who God is and his power. And so I'm going to give you two things. And you might want to write these down. These are really simple that you can remember for today to answer our question. How do you keep the faith? while confronting the facts of your current reality, here's the first one that God tells Jeremiah, God is in control. God is in control. Not Jeremiah, not Zedekiah, not Nebuchadnezzar, not Hamel, not you, not me, not COVID-19, not the Democrats, not Donald Trump, not anything else that you would think of. God is in control, church. The Lord of all heaven who created all things is in control as he was back then, he is today, and will be forever and ever. Amen. You've heard me preach this before, and I will continue to say it. It's a quote by C.S. Lewis. And if you haven't committed this to memory, you need to. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. You've got to answer that question for yourself in your heart. I love a couple weeks ago what Pastor Rod shared when he gave the analogy about is God your spare tire? Is God something you just pull out when you get a flat, pull it out of your trunk, don't really think about it, put it on, get you where you need to go, and then put it back in your trunk and get on with your way, go and live your life how you want to do it. Is that how you treat the God of the universe in your life? If it is, church, I want to help you with something. God is not that way. God is not some lucky rabbit foot that you get to pull out and rub when you need a boost. God is not a casual friend that you visit when it works out and convenient for you. And if I have time, I'll, I might take a look at my Bible. But, oh, I'm so busy. And, oh, I don't have time to pray. And I don't have time to read God's word. That's not what my God is. God is so much more than that. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. You've got to decide that in your heart. And just as I said last week, and we'll continue to say this, how you think will determine how you act. How you think about God will determine how you act towards God. So the question you have to answer today, how do you see God in your life? And if it's not, how's that working for you? Church, did you hear what, what, I, what Jeremiah just pro proclaimed his promise again? 
Nothing is too hard for my God. He is over all things. He is in all things. He is all things. He is the God of all mankind. Nothing is too hard for him. God is in control. Here's the second thing that we need to know. How do we keep our faith while confronting the facts of our current reality? God will prevail. God will prevail. God, the, God continues to go on and respond to Jeremiah. Again, I'm not going to read all of that for you because I want you to go and I want you to read it. And God reminds Jeremiah and, and, and through Jeremiah, the rest of the people listening, Zedekiah and you and I, about their current reality, how they got to where they are. And then when you get down to verse 37, God makes this statement. He says, I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them a singleness of heart and action. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Once more, fields will be bought in this land. What's our current reality, church? We live in a fallen and broken world. And in this fallen and broken world, viruses happen. And, and I'm not just talking about COVID-19. I'm talking about the virus of selfishness. I'm talking about the virus of jealousy. I'm talking about the virus of discord. I'm talking about the virus of greed that can destroy our economy. I'm talking about the virus of divorce that can happen, not only in marriages, but also in churches. I'm talking about the virus of division and dissension, the virus of, of looking down at our fellow man and seeing their situation and not realizing who they are and how we can be of assistance. What is the cure for that? And I want to go back to what Admiral Stockdale said at the very beginning, church, and don't miss this. I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining moment of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade for anything. And that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. Seventy years later, they would return to the land. Fields would once more again be bought and sold, and the people were united in one mind. You can go back a couple weeks to our message on Nehemiah, and we talked about the unity that God brought about during that time and with those people. And that's what God wants from us, church. We talk about when we need to get back together again. Can I help you with something? I think until we learn how to be together, I think we need to stay apart. I honestly believe that because that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be one. He wants us to be united. You know, over the past three years that Elaine and I have been in Yankton, we've seen lots of great things happen. But can I just be honest with you? Can I just be brutally honest with you? There's been some things that have been really hard. And I don't say that for sympathy. I don't say that for, for you to feel bad for me. Please don't do that. Be but I've had people ask me the question, Jeff, have you ever thought about giving up? Have you ever thought about, you know, just packing it up and going back to Sioux Falls and just, just, just being done? Have you ever thought about that? And, and I want to help you with something. Absolutely not. I have never once ever felt that way. Because here's the thing. I know God's call in my life. I, I recognize that God has given me a clear vision of what his church can be in this community. And I believe with all my heart that God's purpose will prevail in that. And, and, and this community will be a beacon of light for all to see. Now, does it look that way right now? No, <laughs> of course it doesn't. We haven't even met face to face in over 12 weeks, right? And even in a bigger picture, our economy is taking such a hit right now. We don't know what that's going to look like, not only in our church or in our community, but in our country. Our country right now is more divided than it's been in, in so long. And keep in mind, we have a presidential election going on this year. It, it's tough. We're in a tough situation. But I want to pray for you again the words of God, the words that Jeremiah says. I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them a singleness of heart and action. 
I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Once more, fields will be bought in this land. Church, God is doing a work right now through the church. And I don't just mean our church in this community. I mean the global church. That I contend, and I've heard so many leaders say this now, that this is in the power of the Spirit of God, that this is going to bring about the greatest revival that you and I will have ever experienced our entire life. And it's not just about our church. And that's why I highly encourage you to join us at 6 p.m. when we come together as our denomination and we seek God's face and we pray for that because I believe that can start today and I want you to be part of it because just as Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29 had the promise of God that yeah it's going to be tough for a while but in the end God will prevail church I've seen the end and we have to look at Revelation 21 I heard a loud voice from the throne saying look God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things have passed away. Church, God will prevail. There's no virus that can keep God's church down. And no matter what your perspective is on that, and we've talked about that, and we're going to continue to talk about that again, God's church will always prevail. It depends on how we think about it. How do you see your God? God is in control, not me, not anything else. And we have to surrender to him. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. You have to settle that question in your heart. And in the end, God will prevail. God's sole purpose for the exile of Israel I believe for the coronavirus is to draw his people closer to him by drawing them closer to each other. So I want to ask you, what do you need to put in a clay jar? See, when Jeremiah took that promise of God, he was told to put it in a clay jar and seal it and say, this is God's promise. This is going to last for a long time. And we know from history that that's what they used to do with very important documents is they would seal them kind of in a seal in like a safe to keep it forever. That's where we get the Dead Sea Scrolls from, those types of things. And I think this is a great visual for us to think of today. What's something that you need to seal and put in a clay jar? We need to face the facts of our current reality. We need to never lose faith that God will prevail in the end. Maybe there's a loved one who's really far from God right now that you might think they'll never come back or they'll never see that again. Write their name down seal it and keep it and say once again this is going to happen again maybe maybe you've you've had some problems financially throughout this coronavirus and, and you don't think that this is going to come out write it down write down where you want to be maybe maybe there's an addiction that you've been struggling with that you can't seem to break free from write it down and seal it and claim the promise of god and church collectively as a church what I would like us to do, what I would beg us to do, and we can do this together again at six o'clock tonight at our together, is to claim the promise that God has for our church in our community, which is to shine the light of Jesus, to be a people that are in love with our God first. And through that love, through Him, we love each other. And as we do that, church, that is the most attractive thing on planet Earth. And when the people around us see that and understand that and know that, that's the promise that God wants for our church. And, and we can bring about God's kingdom here on earth now. And church, I believe now more than ever that God wants to do that. Not just only in our community, but in our world. And we're going to do that this summer. And, and I would highly encourage you to come next week. Next week, we're going to talk through what it means to, to what it looks like um, through our, our changes with the coronavirus. And we want to talk through what that looks like. And then the rest of the series... We're going to be talking through the book of 1 Peter. We're going to spend some time going through what God, living God's way through one of Jesus' most trusted disciples, Peter, who wrote an amazing letter. And we're just going to go through it together as a church. And in our life groups, we're going to go through the book of 1 Peter together. And we can understand how God wants us to live throughout this summer. And I really want to encourage you, who is somebody in your life who needs to hear this? Who is somebody that you can share this with? 
that you can bring on this journey together over these next few months, that we can live the way that God intended us to live and never lose, give up the faith of the outcome. Jesus, I thank you that your truth always prevails. Jesus, I thank you so much for walking through the life of Jeremiah. And, and we know that Jeremiah never lived to see the promise that he proclaimed through you, through that daily intentional time that he had with you, God, that he could see you work in the ordinary. And he didn't have to look for the extraordinary because he saw you working through the ordinary every single day. And that example of somebody who was coming, who didn't have the right attitude, who was trying to take advantage of him. But yet that situation you used to show Jeremiah and everyone watching and King Zedekiah and us today that you will prevail. You are in control. And God, your purpose and your plan will always prevail. God, I thank you that we don't have to surrender ourselves to the randomness of life that happens. God, we live in a fallen and broken world where sinful and broken people make sinful and broken decisions that can hurt and destroy and pain. We, we face death, we face suffering, we face separation in God, and none of that is anything that you want. That's why you give us the gift of Jesus. That's why you give us the local church that we can come together and be of one people and celebrate the fact that we weren't made for this earth. We were made for something far better that will come. And in the meantime, our job is to bring your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. God, I thank you for that promise and we hold to that. And God, I lift up every person who's listening to me right now who understands that there's a situation that they need to face the brutal facts. They need to confront the fact that right now the situation is not what I want it to be. But that they would take it and they would seal that promise of yours, God. And they would hold on to that and they would know that in the end, you will prevail because you are in control. And by our daily surrender to you, Jesus, we know and we trust in you and in nothing else. We thank you and we praise you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you We'd like you to join us for communion together. Again, you can grab crackers, chicks, bread, whatever you need, milk, juice, water. Um, but we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper at this time together. 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul writes, For what I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you that you've given us every spiritual blessing. And God, we just ask, we humbly seek your will in our lives, in our church, and in our community. Thank you that we can join together as a body of Christ and to celebrate this Lord's Supper together, and to celebrate the birthday of your church. Thank you and praise you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Love to have you join us tonight, 6 o'clock, right back here online. Can't wait, church. Have a blessed rest of your Sunday.